interpretive or analytical. In biochemistry, there are methods we can use, things like gel electrophoresis and column chromatography, in order to separate molecules based on various properties. Now, we might just be wanting to separate them in order to see what's in there. Say, how pure is a mixture? Um, what size are the things in the mixture? Or what properties do these have, depending on our separation method? But other times, we might be separating them because we want to isolate the thing, one of the things and get rid of the other things. And so when we're doing these, we can describe these two different things as, with the same technique as doing it either for like analytical purposes or preparative purposes. Now, if you're doing it for analytical purposes, here you're typically used to using a small sample, just like a small bit of your sample, just to get a look. When you're doing preparative, well, now you have to use like all of your sample. And so often this involves doing things to concentrate down your sample to reduce the volume. But even still, you often have, are doing things on a larger scale. So if you're doing chromatography, this might be using a bigger column. If you're doing a gel, this might mean using wider wells. Um, they even have like well combs where like the whole there's like one little well for the ladder and then a big wide well. Because what you need to do is then you're going to separate the molecules and then actually cut out that big band out of the gel and extract the molecule. So when we talk about gel electrophoresis, much more in other posts, but we're basically unwinding molecules. So we're like denaturing proteins or RNA or DNA. And then we're sending them traveling through a gel mesh using electricity. And the longer the molecules are, the bigger they are, the more they're gonna get tangled up and the longer it's gonna take them to travel through to the bottom. Well, they would travel through to the bottom except that we turn off the electricity so then they stop part way there. And so then you get these bands where you can see where these different products were based, sized out based on their size. And so this allows us to see, okay, well, how many different mixed, how many different things were in there and like what relative size are there? We can compare them to ladders and various things. So there's a lot we can see just by visualizing it. Well, we have to dye it first, um, though we can visualize it with like a fluorescent dye or something. A very similar thing within the case of proteins, but here we're typically using like a colorometric dye, so something that you can actually see visually without having to put it on a reader. But in any of these cases, you're separating the molecules and then taking a look. Now, if you wanted to, for the DNA or the RNA, if you wanted to actually purify these, well, what you can do is you can actually cut them out of the gel and then extract them, and much more on how in other posts. But so you can use gel electrophoresis as a purification method. You might have heard of like page purification. Well, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, we can use um, typically like a TBE gel, um, just like an acrylamide, TBE page gel, so like an acrylamide gel, in order to separate the DNA or the RNA um, and then cut them out. Um, and that way you're able to cut out just the band corresponding to the size of the piece that you want and not all that other stuff. And, but, so this is really great if you're doing things like in vitro transcription, say, um, or you're trying to prepare a sequencing library, or you're actually having to like size select the fragments and select fragments that are the right ones and not the wrong ones. This also comes into play with agarose gels. If you're say running a PCR reaction, maybe you're running a PCR reaction. So basically we take a template DNA, um, so a piece of DNA, and then there's a region of it that we want to make lots of copies of it. And so we use primary which are these short little pieces that stick and book in the ends and then make lots of copies. So we might just want to see, okay, what well, did a PCR reaction work? Maybe you're doing the PCR reaction just to see if a specific sequence was there because those primers have to bind to a specific sequence in order for the reaction to happen. So maybe you just want to see if the PCR reaction worked. Maybe you're going to use that PCR reaction product. Um, but either way, you want to be able to see what's in the mixture. And so if you run a little bit of that sample on a gel, you can then see, okay, well, did the, do I see a band around the right size? Do I have a band that corresponds to this whole copy thing or just bands corresponding to those little primers I added? If you're doing, trying to determine whether a specific sequence is present, you can do things like restriction enzyme res analytical digests uh, with restriction enzymes. So sometimes you actually see like analytical, um, you call these like diagnostic digests, and sometimes you actually call see like analytical gels and stuff called diagnostic gels. Um, and so here you're just trying to get a look.
Um, you can think about like not actually stealing the patient, just getting a little bit of sample from the patient to take something to test for. So typically when we're doing an analytical thing, we're just taking a little sample and we're seeing, um, seeing what's there. Um, we might not be diagnosing like a problem or anything, but just um, getting a sense of what is in a sample. And so in this way, you are able to get a look you can also, though, if you wanted to purify out that PCR product, um, maybe you have multiple PCR products there, like there are some non-specific ones and you really only want that specific one, or this really, really comes into play, this gel extraction for the um, agarose gels, is when you're doing some sort of restriction cloning. So you basically take like a plasmid, so a circular piece of DNA, and then you use restriction enzymes, so these sequence-specific DNA cutters, to actually cut out a specific region. Now, if you just want um, that region, and then you go, typically then you go and stitch it to the backbone, so like a part of another plasmid stitch them together. So if you have like two plasmids and you're cutting them both and taking part of one and part of the other, well, you need to be able to separate those parts. Um, and you can do this by running gel electrophoresis after you do that cutting and then cutting out and extracting the bands. Now, in this case, you're wanting to get all of that. You're wanting to take that all because you want to, to use everything that you got that was cut out of the right parts. Um, and so you running a preparative gel in this case. It's the same thing, except you're loading all of your sample. Um, and so you might need to be running a bigger well or something like that. Um, what this really come, um, and so in, that's for DNA and RNA, you're typically purifying them out of the gels. Well, for a protein, here we're often using like size exclusion chromatography or other forms of chromatography. With chromatography, what we do is we take molecules and we put flow them, well, like column chromatography. We flow them through these little columns, um, these little like tubes filled with resin, which are these little beads. And these little beads have different properties that are going to separate them based on different things. So we can do size exclusion chromatography where the, where the beads have these little pores and so they're going to separate the proteins based on their size. So you might say, okay, well this is similar to a gel electrophoresis, right? Well typically with gel electrophoresis, we're just doing a tiny little sample, we're just doing an analytical type of thing. But with column chromatography, what we can do is we can do a preparative scale. So we can actually collect out the thing, the protein as it comes off the column and then collect just the fractions that we want and we can know which fractions that we want. So I say fractions because it's coming out and it's going like a mill and then a mill and then a mill and then a mill, either with like an automated fraction collector or you just like manually standing there with a tube and a tube and a tube. Um, but if it's going through one of these machines, like an active, one of these FPLC machines, well here it's going out and it's going through a UV detector and then into a different tube. Um, and then you can compare the UV trace to which tubes and see which ones have the protein in them that you want. Um, and you can do similar things um, with like HPLC um, for like smaller molecules typically. Um, this is like, they use columns, it uses high pressure. Um, these often use like base, separate things based on like their polarity. Um, but anyway, the same sort of idea where you're separating things as they go through a column based on a various property. And so with proteins, if you wanted to separate the proteins based on their size as a purification strategy, you can do so with column chromatography. Um, and if for HPLC, you can also use this as a purification method. So in both of these cases, that would be preparative scale. But for both of these, you can also use analytical scale. With analytical scale, you're typically loading less protein, less sample, um, so you're typically using a smaller column, but really the big thing that defines it is what you're going after. Are you going after just to look and see, okay, where do I get peaks, and what does that correspond to in terms of the size, if you're doing size exclusion, in terms of the polarity, if you're doing some sort of HPLC, where it's separating based on the polarity. Um, so based on those properties, you can then get an idea about the things that are inside, how much of the things that are inside, based on like how high the peaks are, as well as um, like the properties, depending on which property that you are separating on, where the things come off of the column is going to tell you about their properties. So with a size exclusion column, um, with we also call this gel filtration, here the bigger things are going to come off first because they can't go through all those pores and the smaller things are gonna come out later. So if you get a, a big peak that's early on and then a little peak that's later, well the big peak early on is going to be a lot of a bigger protein and then the small peak later on is going to be less of a smaller protein. Although remember that the bigger protein has bigger signal just because it's bigger, even if you don't have as many copies of it.
so you can learn things about it even without and so we can do this analytical level in order to get that information we can also do analytical size exclusion chromatography to see if molecules are interacting um, so if molecules stably interact well now if you have that big protein and you have that little protein now the little proteins piggyback on the big protein now they're going to show an even shifted peak um, it might be kind of hard to see the shift depending on how big the big protein is but you should be able to see the disappearance of the smaller protein so there are things that we can do at this analytical scale and here we're typically using like these little thin columns um, narrow columns long and skinny so that you have the most separation but with still a small volume so with making for samples like this you need to make your volume small um, and so we can use for like proteins and even for like nucleic acids and stuff we have the like spin co concentrators these are typical these are actually like um, centrifugal ultra filtration devices and much more on how they work in the other in another post but basically they have a membrane the things that are bigger than the membrane are going to stay in the little bucket and the things that are smaller are going to go through and so you're able to concentrate samples that way um, you can also concentrate samples for like rna and dna they make these like concentration um little columns you know little spin columns just like you might use for like a mini prep or a pcr purification where basically the rna or the dna sticks to the column you wash everything off and then you just elude it so get it off the column in a tiny little volume when you're doing these concentrating it can get really scary because you're taking like all of these works worth of work and like now you have it in a couple of microliters but you need to do that in order to have your sample concentrated enough to put through up your method you're using you can also, for concentrating, like precipitate things um, and then remove the liquid and then resuspend it in a smaller amount of liquid. Even if you could, like, just stick a whole ton of ton of stuff in a gel, well, when you gel, you want the bands to be as sharp as possible, you want your things through the column to be as sharp as possible, so you want to minimize the volume, hence the concentration. So, but that's just a technical note. But the real point is that you have this, you can do these things at a preparative level or an analytical level. And so you might see this terminology used and don't get confused about it. Um, in, from a practical standpoint, the analytical, you're typically using a smaller volume, a part of your sample, um, potentially like a smaller, smaller column or smaller gels in your well or wells in your gel. <laughs> um, and for the preparative, you're typically using bigger things. The real difference between these two is that with the preparative scale, you're actually trying to recover what you're separating, or at least some of what you're separating, away from all of that other stuff you don't want. With analytical, here you're just trying to get a look at what's inside, at the various properties, maybe things about purity, um, and we can get information about the various components of the sample based on our separate, the separate knowing about the separation method that we used. So is it telling us about size? Is it telling us about um, polarity and then based on like how strong the signal is how much of it is there and then how many different things are there so there's a lot that we can learn from these analytical methods but when analytical our goal is not to actually go and take out that end product um, or part of the product um, we're not trying to rescue things and so that's why we only want to use a small amount of our sample so we don't have to go and try to rescue our thing out of it because even if you could recover everything that you put in um, well, you have to work to recover it, and typically you're going to lose some yield along the way. Um, but with preparative, here our goal is to actually recover as much as much as possible, and so we want to get our stuff down to a smaller volume, load it through whatever we're doing, and then isolate the part that we want, get rid of all that stuff that we don't want. So preparative, analytical, and Hope that helps you understand and don't get confused when you see those terms. And remember analytical, sometimes you see that as diagnostic. Um, and yeah, so these are just a couple of words that we use to try to describe like our goals of an experiment um, and the kind of scale of the equipment we might be needing. Um, so yeah, hope that helps and happy separating.